This morning we want to examine The Ancestor by Ita Mercado as a pre-colonial African novel. Now what you need to note is that there is a certain level of technicality that is as often associated with the understanding of the pre-colonial African novel. This is because the, the pre-colonial African novel was not written in the pre-colonial era. In fact, the pre-colonial African novel was written at the peak of the colonial era. It was written at the peak of the colonial era. The pre-colonial African novel was written in the colonial era as a way of reflecting, looking back to Africa's glorious past. So when we talk about the pre-colonial African novel, it's not that there were African writers in the pre-colonial era who wrote novels for us. No. Okay? So if you want to call it a pre-colonial novel, then we need to understand the technicalities involved in why it is called a pre-colonial novel. Let's understand the technicality involved, okay? Because you see, pre-colonial novels are post-colonial novels. Pre-colonial novels are post-colonial novels. And by postcolonial novels, we mean novels written as a reaction to postcolonialism. Novels written as a reaction to postcolonialism. And they were mostly written in the colonial era. Some were written after the uh, colonialism. Uh, after the colonial encounter. So the technical term that we will use to understand, that we deploy to understand pre-colonial novel is The pre-colonial novel is a palimpsest in post-colonial novel. The pre-colonial novel exists as a palimpsest in post-colonial novels. Please take note of that. The pre-colonial novel exists as a palimpsest in post-colonial novel. So the term palims palimpsest refers to a script A writing that is written underneath a more recent script or writing.
So to think of the palimpses, think of what you used to do probably in your primary school. Where you have where you have written something on your notebook or on the blackboard. And afterwards, you now try to write another thing on top of that earlier writing. Probably you try to erase the, the old one, and then you wrote something else on top of the old writing. OK? That is how palimpses work. To understand palimpses, you need to understand it in terms of an earlier writing that is now fenced because a newer material has been superimposed on it. I'll give you another instance. Maybe a painting on a building. Maybe you have, before this, we have this yellow paint on this building. We had a blue one before then. Then after the owner said, we don't like blue, we want yellow, and then decide to paint yellow. What you see now is the current paint, which is yellow. But if you scratch it, underneath it, you have the blue paint. So that blue paint is the palimpsest. OK? And that's a beautiful analogy. Now we should understand um, why the pre-colonial um, African novel is a palimpsest in post-colonial novels. So, going by that analogy, the blue paint is the palimpsest, the, the pre-colonial novel, while the yellow paint is the current writing, the post-colonial novel. So, the pre-colonial novel hardly exists as, as as peer it's, it hardly exists in its peer form it is usually mixed. With other scripts. Usually mixed in post-colonial scripts. I think one writer who has tried to recall the pre-colonial era in its purest form is Elechia Madi in The Concubine. But even then, The Concubine is a post-colonial novel because it was published after the colonial incident. So it is a, re a way of recollecting what happened in the past, not that Leche Madi lived in the pre-colonial era. It's simply remembering, trying to remember, OK? So that's what we mean by the post-colonial novel, the pre-colonial novel being a palimpsest in a post-colonial novel. It is that which has to be retrieved. It has to be what? Retrieved. It has to be retrieved. Retrieved. It has to be salvaged. It has to be retrieved. It has to be salvaged. In Archibald's Things Fall Apart, the pre-colonial novel is a code text. It's a code text. It's a code text. It's a code text with 
v postcolonial script it's a good text in a postcolonial script that means it exists alongside okay the postcolonial script because in things fall apart you have the first part being devoted to life in Igbo pre-colonial societies. That's life in, in Igbo society before the coming of the white men. All right? And then the second part deals with life in Igbo society after the white men had arrived. So then, in Things Fall Apart, I say that the pre-colonial um, manuscript is a good text with a post-colonial manuscript or post-colonial script. The pre-colonial um, script is a good text with post the post-colonial script in Chino Achebe's Things Fall Apart. But in other, I mean, most other postcolonial novels, the pre-colonial experience is a subtext. It's a subtext. It's a subtext. Meaning it is a palimpsest. It lies underneath. Because we can only remember, we can only recall, we do, do not live in the pre-colonial era, we can only remember how it used to be, while talking about other things. So that is the experience that you have with Eti Mercado's The Ancestor. I have a note um, on my website that I made on The Ancestor. So if you Google the ancestor by Eti Mercado, it should be one of the first um, one of the first items that you find on Google, right? So in Eti Mercado's um, the ancestor, the pre-colonial experience exists as a palimpsest in a post-colonial text. Exists as a palimpsest in a postcolonial text. That is how you are going to read the novel. Because the novel actually talks about the postcolonial experiences of the oral people. The novel actually talks about the postcolonial experiences of the oral people. Okay? The novel was published in 1983. Forty years ago, so you could see that it's a post-colonial novel, and the novel deals with life in the Aksan community shortly after the departure of the colonial masters. So that makes it a post-colonial novel. But in the experiences that the novel depicts, we can retrieve. The pre colonial experience, which, is a, which exists as a palimpsest in that novel. In the experiences detained in the ancestor, we can retrieve the pre colonial era. which exists as a palimpsest. The novel offers us a glimpse of life as it was in our traditional societies before the coming of the white man, even while talking about 
contemporary reality. Right? When we are talking about contemporary realities. A, excuse me, a discerning mind will still see that underneath these current realities, the novel provides us a window to look into our past before things turned out the way they are at the moment. And shortly we're going to talk about that. The novel opens with the arrival of Tissom back to Yaksan village. He has been away for 30 years. He's been away for 30 years. studying in different parts of the world, especially in Western countries. Of course, if you need a copy of the novel, I have it, because I know it's difficult to find a copy. So you can get a copy from, from me. So he, he has been studying in Western countries, has been abroad, studying. And as the novel opens, Tissom returns to the community of Diasa To meet it, only to meet it in various stages of decay and moral decadence. So Tisong is so educated that he now has a PhD in the humanities, one of the humanistic courses, has a PhD, one of the humanistic courses. And as he comes back, he's expected to be a leader of his community. He's expected to be a leader of his community. So the traditional or the pre-colonial values of the people are seen in the dramatization of Tisang's life in relation to his community and in relation to the rest of the members of the community. This is seen in the fact that this is seen in the fact that despite having stayed abroad for many years, Tisong still remembers and values the culture of his people. Tisong still remembers and values the culture of his people. For instance, he's seen going about the village greeting the people. which is one of the cultural values of the Africans. The African people value greetings. And children are taught 
by their parents right from birth to learn how to greet. Not greeting an elderly person could signal pride, could signal arrogance, could signal lack of home training, could be seen to be disrespectful to see an elderly person on the road and then you walk past without greeting. It's a sacrilege. In certain cultures like the Yoruba culture, greeting, greetings are dramatic. Okay? Greeting can be very dramatic. Greeting is staged. It's drama on its own. Okay? You've ever seen how greeting is done in traditional Yoruba culture. Okay? Not now that Macroni is saying that they don't kneel anymore. Okay? And when somebody wants to kneel, uh, kneel down, greeting says they don't kneel anymore. They still kneel. Okay? Meaning he's trying to criticize the modern culture which um, young people don't have respect for elders. You know, they just see elders and then wave as if they are Americans. Hello. 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 And they pass. Whereas they're supposed to prostrate and roll on the ground <laughs> while getting the elders. Even if the ground is muddy, All right, wherever you meet the elder, whether on the tile floor, whether it, it is muddy, okay? Doesn't matter whether you're wearing the whitest white, you have to prostrate and roll on the ground. All right? And sometimes even when you're on the phone, the same thing. The other is perhaps in Lagos and you're in New York and you're calling the other to greet. Even though he doesn't see you, you still have to <laughs> stress. That shows respect, all right, for the elder. Okay, but McCann now says that they don't do it anymore. Okay, so don't kneel, don't kneel, don't kneel. So they're still new. okay? Showing that um, the young people of today are refused to um, take the greeting seriously, the greetings of the elders seriously, the way they should. They now greet the elders like white people, okay? Who simply tell you hello without waiting to hear whether you have responded or not. In traditional African society, somebody tells you, um, they don't even say hello, they wait. Okay, no matter where they're going, they'll wait and dramatize the greeting. Very important. Okay, so you could see that greeting is valued across African uh, cultural spaces. Whether it's in the Yoruba culture or any other cultural space. And the child who does not do that in traditional pre-colonial African society has not been well raised, okay? So today, if um, a young person has a uh, beef with you, the best way the young person will show that you or she has beef with you is not to greet him, right? And that's why I'm not going to greet him. That shows that we're not on good terms, right? For in traditional African culture, that, is, that will not be so, okay? No matter what the elderly person has done to you, greeting is basic, all right? So you need to learn our pre-colonial cultural values, which is seen in this post-colonial novel, The Ancestor, okay? It's a post-colonial novel. It talks about the uh, moral decadence, the, the new colonial politics in that sense, the aftermath of colonial rule, but in that story, in that superimposed story, we can still find the palimpsest underneath. 
which tells the story of a people who were once great, who had their own cultural value. And that's the cultural value, that's the cultural value that we are trying to retrieve in this um, novel at this point. Okay? At the at the reception, at the reception um, organized for Tisong, the reception organized for Tisong, it is also seen that he has not forgotten the cultural ethos of the people. He has not forgotten the cultural ethos of his people. For instance, he still can dance the traditional dance steps of the people. He can dance, despite having spent uh, 25 to 30 years abroad, depending on how you calculate the the years, whether you're calculating it traditionally or um, using the modern calendar, he still remembers his tradition, especially the dancing steps of his, um, of his community, the chant of the Igbe society, of which is a member, all right? The chant of the Igbe society, he has not forgotten the language. He still speaks the language of his people. And this is what makes the elders proud. So I think that makes the elders to be proud of him. He greets, you know, remember that, as I said, in traditional societies, we have um, specific ways of greeting. So Tisan has not forgotten how greeting is done uh, in his age great, in the equal society, in his community. For instance, if you go to probably your low government meetings, you realize that there are some, some, some of these young people who were raised in Lagos, Abuja, who don't know how to greet, right? Using the code of the local government. Right, and they have to be taught. Some, some of them usually mix one little government meeting with another. Right, we show that that shows that they have not been acculturated. Then, if you go to a kid low government meeting, a student meeting, they have a way of greeting. Right, that's the first thing that we used to know whether you've been raised in the community, whether you are Lagos, Eket, or Abuja, Eket, right? The same thing with any other new government area. So the greeting is very important. Most of you are asking how they greet in your new government when you want to stand up and speak in traditional meetings. What do we say? Okay? Some people might even say, praise the Lord. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> I see that in a, in a prayer meeting, prayer band meeting. Okay? So this one knows this, how it is done. And this impresses the elders. So through these greetings, we um, have a glimpse of the cultural ethos of the people through these dance steps, through this chance of the equity society, we have a glimpse of the fact that the people of Biasan had their culture before the coming of the colony of masters. That there was once when they lived and practiced their culture before the coming of the colony of masters. And so, we, because of that, we now know that the colonial masters did not say the truth. That they lied, that they, we didn't have culture. After all, are they the owners of the Igbo society? No. Igbo society was used to police society. It was an institution 
used to, one of the institutions used to regulate society, maintain peace and order in society. The Igbo, Akata, all of those institutions were used to regulate, ensure stability and security in society. So after the reception, after the reception, Tisan will now face the main task that brought him back from the white man's land. After the reception in honor of Tisan, he will now face the main task that brought him back from the Western world. And the task is for him to write a book about the ancestor, his family ancestor, his family Petra. Okay? He wants to write a, a book about the oldest Petrarch in his family by name Sinwe. By name Sinwe. Sinwe is the ancestor. He lived and died many years ago and is revered the oldest member of the family the ancestor of the, of the Tisong's family. Tisong wants to use the person of Sinwe to trace the history of his community. Remember, I said that Tisong has a PhD in one of the humanities courses, possibly anthropology or sociology or history and anthropology. Okay? So Sinwe now exists as a carving, the most prized carving of the family. Of the family has many carvings, okay? But Sinwe is the most prized of these carvings. Sinwe has many carvings, uh, the family has many carvings. But Sinwe is the most prized of these carvings. And the carvings, including Sinwe, are being custodied by Tisong's uncle by name Ekon. Being custodied by Tisong's uncle by name Ekon. By name Ekon. Which means war. And that's how it is spelled in our Okay? Which means war. His uncle is known for being hot-tempered. Uncle Ekong is known for being hot-tempered. And this is what cost him his, his teaching job after he beat up the headmaster of the school. Okay, so you know that in an organized place, um, like a school, um, getting physical with someone 
is a serious offense. Okay? And this is what they come with, and it cost him his teaching job. So he's known for being hot tempered. Have um, his Tisong's father having passed away, Tisong's father died while Tisong was abroad and he couldn't come back to even witness the burial. So Tisong's father having passed away, Ekong is now the oldest member of the family and the family head, the head of the family. Okay? Remember what that means. What that means is that traditional African society, pre-colonial African society, um, reverse the age. Reverse the age. That's what? Reverse age. All right? Because leadership is by seniority. Leadership is by age. Traditional African society, pre-colonial African society, reverse age, reverse age. Reverse age. As leadership is by seniority. Okay? So Tisong's father was the oldest, and he was the, uh, he was the family head while alive. Now that he's dead, they come who's the second um, person who is the eldest now takes over the leadership in the family and he is the one who custodies these family carvings the one who is in custody of these family carvings including Sinue the ancestor Sinue is the ancestor and that's where we get the title of the novel Sinue is the ancestor, and that is where we get the title of the novel. So Tisong goes to Ekon to ask after Sinue, given the purpose that he has for the art object. Remember that even in the colonial era, the colonial masters were interested in our art objects, even when they considered us to be barbaric, primitive, and savages. So if the new government is also interested in these objects, the new government is also interested in these art objects, the new colonial government, and has asked each family to surrender the carvings to the authorities. Perhaps they want to use them to form museums. They even offered to buy. Remember, the colonial masters have said that we were not civilized, yet they took those carvings back to their country to form their museum. So Ekong tells Tisong that Sinue is missing. Sinue has gone missing. I cannot find Sinue. That he had to bury all the ca carvings at the Greek, at the at the creek. At the creek where the government was looking for them, even offering money. So most families hid, most families hid their carvings from the authorities. The authorities hid their carvings from the authorities.
and Ekong did the same. And as he tells Tison, when he, when he went back to check on the carvings, they were nowhere to be found. Probably Flav had taken them away. Or somebody has, must have seen him burying them and has gone to steal them. Of course, this is not true. Ekong is blind to Tison because he's suspicious of Tison's intention with Sinue. Suspicious with Tison's intention with Sinue. Does not trust him enough because he has spent so many years in the white man's country. He doesn't know the values that he has brought back. So he lies that Sinue has gone missing. And so the major conflict in the novel revolves around the ancestor, revolves around Sinue. The major conflict in the novel revolves around the ancestor, revolves around Sinue. Remember that there's no work of art that has no conflict. There's no work of art without conflict. So the major conflict in Etimakado's The Ancestor is the ancestor. The major conflict revolves around the ancestor. The major conflict in Etimakado's The Ancestor revolves around the ancestor, which is Sinui, the art object that represents the oldest patriarch in the family. So when Tisong tells, when Ekong tells Tisong that Sinwe is missing, and cannot be traced, Tisong gets angry with his un uncle. And this develops into a quarrel. that let her prove to be deadly. Let her prove to be deadly, or almost deadly. This one is angry because his uncle has been careless in his perception. His uncle has been careless with the most valuable art object in the family. Why should he be so careless with the most prized object, art object in the family. Why is he a custodian of the, of the, of the family uh, properties if he be cannot take care of them? This is Tissam's um, point of anger with his uncle. And so in the heat of the argument, it's in the heat of the anger, this song makes an insulting statement about his uncle, a statement that impugns his character. character. I like my eyes. Okay? And I impugn on the uncle's character. Certain insults are better done in the traditional language and are more effective in the traditional language. 
se ricorda non tu prego un dubbio like trying to disparage the uncle the uncle's birth uncle's birth He has made other accusations, bothering on the uncle, perhaps selling the art objects. And then he also makes a dispassionate remark about the uncle's birth. And the statement implies probably that the uncle Had a defective birth, perhaps a twin, or a twin, and so makes the uncle in farm terrible, in farm terrible, in French, a bad child. Okay? In farm terrible, a bad child. By a child in Pump Terror. By a child. Perhaps because the uncle's bed was defective, perhaps the uncle was born in twin. And you know that twins then were not allowed to live. So somehow the uncle was made to live. And then it was like a secret. But of course, in these communities, there were no secrets. Secrets were only secrets because they were not spoken about. Okay, so somehow they knew his origins, his birth. So in the heat of anger, who will tell you the real truth about yourself? So once in a while, you get people angry, like you hear some truths, right? <clears throat> You don't really get people angry. You don't know how I used to praise you. When they're angry, they will change the language. They tell you the hard truth about it. So having made this statement, having made this statement, Tisam damages his relationship with his uncle. And <clears throat> creates a feud. And creates a feud. that will not be easily resolved that will not be easily resolved except through traditional oaths except through traditional oaths except through traditional oaths So the case has to go through the various stages of litigation available in traditional society, in any human society, traditional society. It's like taking a case from the primary court to the highest court in the land, in modern society. Now, how the case between Tissom and his uncle is judged shows that pre-colonial African society had their own justice system against what the colonial masters 
and try to assume about us that we do not have any workable or working institution. If we didn't have, why was society stable? The, state have to, the case has to be resolved at age grade. At the age grade, Tisong is um, warned and fined about um, insulting his uncle. Um, he's asked to apologize because age is revered in, pre in pre colonial African societies. You cannot insult an elderly person and go scot free, right? So you are, he's asked to apologize, pay fine, but Ekong will not be appeased because his character has been impugned. Okay? And so he believes, or maybe his anger is driving him, will not be appeased. Till the case goes to the village council. So you could see that in traditional, from the, it's a post-colonial novel, but it, give us, it, it gives us a glimpse of life in pre-colonial society, that in pre-colonial society we had ways of res resolving conflicts as any society in the world, any civilized society in the world, stage by stage. And then from one stage, then you move to a higher stage. If that stage cannot resolve, you move to a higher stage. It gets to the village council. And even at that point, the stage, the, the conflict, the case is not resolved because of Ekong's anger. And because his character has been impugned. Meaning that in traditional African societies, people value that character over anything. To kill an individual character is to kill the individual while alive, right? To kill the individual's character is to kill the individual while he's alive. So there's no meaning, there's no need to live. If the individual has to live with the stain in his character. And this is why Ekong decides that he will take a traditional oath to clear his name. And I will take a traditional oath to clear his name. He has been accused and no amount of apologies or appeasement from Artisan would do except the accusation is withdrawn or he clears his name. So in traditional African societies, the individual's name is more important than anything. So we are talking about pre-colonial African cultural values being retrieved from this post-colonial text. So he wants to chew the aggressive seeds. He wants to chew the aggressive seeds. Aggressive seeds. The aggressive seeds. The aggressive seeds are dangerous or poisonous bean seeds. Poisonous bean seeds. Of course, being poisonous means it can kill the individual, right? Can kill the individual. And the oath consists of the accused taking seven of the seeds. Seven. Seven is a significant number in pre-colonial African culture. Okay, seven, the significant number in pre-colonial African.
account. So we'll take seven acres seeds. Ekong will take seven acres seeds to clear his name. Ekong opts to go for the oath, the traditional oath. It is believed that if he's innocent, he will live, will survive the seeds, the chewing of the seeds. But if, if he's guilty, he will die. That was how that was the apex of justice in traditional African society. Alright? It correlates with other forms of um old taking like the MBM. All right? Like the MBM, it's still being taken today, which is when people don't really want to do serious agreement. All right? When people want to do serious agreement, they still use it. When they don't want, when, when they don't, if they don't want it to be, if the agreement is not serious, they can use the Bible. Because you know that the Bible does not kill. Okay? But when if the deal is serious, the Bible is covered with grace, it won't kill anybody. Right? That's why they use it to sway in government officials. Right? Mm -hmm. You swear by the Bible that you'll be faithful. Okay? And bear true allegiance. They will sway easily, so nothing will happen. Okay? But, you know, even then, these government officials, when they really have good deals that involve like um, billions of naira during elections, okay, they won't use the Bible. They won't come and say, swear by the Bible and take this one billion that you support me. Would they do that? No. no. They'll bring one pot that has contains different concoctions. All right? So that to just see the pot alone, you run. OK? Then they keep one billion this way, then the pot is this way. This way. That way you take this money, you not betray me. OK? So, so when you swear, then you know. But if you don't do as you have sworn, then your life is in danger. It might not even be your life, you're the one of your entire family. Okay? But when it's time to take um, the mantle of leadership, they use the Bible. Because the Bible doesn't have it utterly, but the Lord is full of mercy and His grace is sufficient for everyone. All right? Good. So, Ekon is going to swear by, we're going to chew this Ekmesa seed. Of course, we have, let's say we have Mbiam, we have Bukan, the one that is put in the eyes. Okay? You make a statement. If I did this thing, let me not be able to use my eyes, blind my eyes. If I didn't make this, if I didn't do this thing, let my eye be free. Then they put it. All right? So if you did it, it's your body that will tell you. Hmm? And you have to confess everything before they remove it. OK? There are many forms. Very effective, traditional methods of achieving justice. OK? Which is why we miss our free colonial societies. One that uh, Udabia sings about in his song, and the song is legendary, about a stream where you go and you stand in it and say, if I did this thing and um, carry me away, I will not be seen again. If I didn't do it, just throw me out. Okay? <laughs> the same thing. That means structures existed in pre-colonial African society to ensure that society was stable, crime-free, People, in fact, even if you didn't want to tell the truth, because you know that there is stream somewhere that you'll be taken to, 
there's Ndiam, all right? There's Zukan, that will blind your eyes. You tell the truth, okay? You, you live a good life, all right? Not this day that people are um, doing all evils and they're still swearing, using the name of God. Say, God will kill me if, I, if I'm telling the truth. And God is just watching. <laughs> because because the, the modern God that we have, that we worship, is a God of grace. You understand? <laughs> Doesn't judge us like God according to our deeds. So even when you say, God will kill me, it's, nothing will happen. <laughs> but the father will not say, let Ogun kill me. Or let Shango strike me with thunder. Let Madioha strangle me. We never say that's the Christian God that's so loving. Okay? He loves all of us as his children. Okay? And he doesn't want anything to happen to us. If I even when we speak like that, if somebody says, if my child is speaking out of ignorance, let me forgive you. <laughs> In fact, there are some pastors who preach that as you're sinning, your forgiveness is just flowing at that moment. <laughs> you know, as you sin, the forgiveness just keeps flowing. So you don't even need to ask for it. So that's where we are, and that's why um, society is the way it is. But go back to traditional African society and notice how justice was served. Then, then you realize that. And we have lost an era, okay? So all pleas for Ekon to not swear, not chew the Kbese seeds fall on their ear. All plea by Ekon not to chew the Kbese seeds. On their ear. He insists on chewing the sea. And nearly dies for it. And nearly dies for it. The truth is that the, the seeds are not to be chewed in anger. You chew with anger and you are dead. And Ekong chews it with anger. His tism brings an, an antidote to save Uncle Ekong's life. Tism has to administer an antidote, modern medicine to save a comes life. So what we notice in this novel is that though the traditional ins institutions continue to exist, they are not as effective as they would have been in pre-colonial uh, uh, pre Europe, okay? It's just like you find a boat today in a bar, and both men and women will go and start admiring, touching different parts of the boat, right? And you wonder if that would have been possible in pre-colonial society. In pre-colonial society, women would not even go out, all right? They will give warning that for two weeks, you can go to the farm, gather your firewood, that are your um, food items because in the next one week, nobody's going out. No woman will venture out. Even some men who were not initiated will not go out. <coughs> so where will you have the opportunity to go and admire Igbo and even give Igbo money? You understand? If you have some money, you can even go and give now. So what we are saying is that in this post-colonial novel, these traditional institutions only exist as tokens, as what? Tokens. Cultural tokens. This is as cultural tokens. But when you go out and you see 
the masquerade in a bag. They simply help to remind you of the time in the past when real masquerades were in existence. These ones are just cultural tokens. All right? Because you can go and play dance around and give money. Okay? Sometimes the reason masquerades block people is that they don't have money to give. <laughs> you can't, you don't have um, even 59 to bribe the masquerade. So the masquerade is like, so what's your use? That's why the masquerade uses king. All right? But in traditional societies, it was a serious insti institution. But this is a post-colonial society. Most of these institutions have lost their power, the original power. Probably that's why the code does not work. Even consulting the medium, which happens in the novel, is also seen as a cultural token. It's not as effective. The, the, the person in the shrine is just there to survive. <laughs> All right? Because the gods are hungry. <laughs> They're just there to survive. Okay, which is really explained is, is in these new skits that we have, where um, these people will go to the shrine to consult the gods, and the gods finally reveals that he himself is helpless. Understand? And then they both start laughing. Both the person consulting the god and the gods will start laughing. Okay, for instance, if the person goes to consult the gods and he needs um, money, okay? And the gods offer us to help. It will be shown that even the native doctor is in need of money. And if he had a way of being rich, why would he be in the bush, not in his mansion? People never think of that, right? When they go to the gods to ask for riches, they don't ask the representative of the gods. But well, they themselves have seen the money. Okay? And others go to ask um, a native doctor to kill someone for them. All right? And when they go back to ask for further directions, they find that the native doctor has died. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> so the person you ask to kill an apple is not even immortal. And, and I wonder why they never think about that. Okay, some people go and hand over their entire life, their future destiny to this person, all right, to keep to keep safe, safely, all right? In a post-colonial era. And then when they now go back to retrieve the family, they tell them the native doctor died, died yesterday. But if he had come yesterday, it would have been possible. So what we are saying is that in post-colonial societies, these institutions, exist as mere cultural tokens. Mere cultural tokens. Because they have lost the power that they would have had in pre-colonial societies. They were quite effective in pre-colonial societies, but they are no more. Right now, they are mostly survival strategies. Cultural tokens and survival strategies. And that is reflected in the novel. But that notwithstanding, they give us the existence, 
gives us a glimpse into our past to let us have an idea of how life would have looked like in pre-colonial African societies. So finally, it is with the help of Atibian This is the help of Artidian. Tisang's aunt. That we recover Sinue. where Ekong had buried it in the backyard, this backyard. Atidian is able to cook. Atidian is able to cook the young wife of Ekong to reveal to her where the, where Sinue was buried. They were to cook, persuade. They were to cook, they were to persuade. Here comes wife, here comes young wife to reveal to her where Sinuen was buried. And Sinue is dark up. Sinue is dark up. Sinue is dark. Dark. And dark up. And will be taken to the National Museum. Taken to the National Museum. For display. For display. Now, this action is symbolic. This action is symbolic. In the sense that the digging up of Sinue implies that African culture and tradition will no longer be buried. No longer be buried. But that it will be made known to all peoples of the world. So that they will know that Africa did not begin to exist the moment the Europeans came here. But that we are a people who lived for many years on the earth before even the Europeans came. Because Sinue is a symbol of African culture and as a symbol of African history. Sinue is a symbol of African culture and African history. The story that Tisan will write about Sinue simply by studying its features and characteristics, will expose the culture of the oral people to the world, their ingenuity, their intelligence, their craftsmanship, and their history. 
you can tell a lot from a simple painting because the painting is a text, a script, and there's a story around it. Sinue represents the fact that the pre-colonial African people had a culture. Sinue represents the fact that pre-colonial African people had intelligence. We're not fools, we're not primitive. Sinue reveals that pre-colonial African people were civilized, we're not savages or barbaric as the white people wanted us to believe. Sunwe is a testament, testimony to the fact that the African people were ingenious, were creative, were imaginative. Because it is not only an imaginative mind that can carve, an imaginative mind that can carve, that can draw, that can paint. So, so that ugly as it is, you do not look down on the equal carving of your community. You have to look at that carving and admire the intelligence of the people who made it. Because it's only civilized people that can produce something creative. And to be civilized is to be imaginative, is to produce artworks, produce poetry, produce novels, produce drama texts, sing, dance. These are features of civilization. Tell stories. 